All right, welcome back. Today we'll do a family medicine shelf review. So as usual, we'll keep the same format. We'll start off with some practice questions, then we'll do some differential diagnoses, and then we'll finish off with some rapid review. Feel free to pause the video periodically as I go through the questions if you wanna answer them for yourselves, and we'll go ahead and get started. 23 year old male presents shortly after injury while playing soccer. He reports that his left knee was hit by another player while planting for a kick, and he reports hearing a pop sound coming from his knee. On physical exam, the left knee is significantly swollen, and when the femur's position is fixed, the tibia demonstrates laxity when pulled anteriorly. Which of the following is most likely injured in this patient? The patellar tendon, the ACL, the PCL, the MCL, or the medial meniscus? So... The answer for this one was the anterior cruciate ligament. And so I bolded the big hints that were supposed to be um, the giveaways in this question. The pop sound, the significant swelling, and then the classic test and exam finding. So let's go through each of these injuries but under acute knee trauma. So ACL was the injury in this case. So as you can see here, here's the femur on top of the tibia and the ACL comes from the posterior end of the femur to the anterior part of the tibia. So you tear this and the tibia slides forward when you pull it forward because this is holding it posteriorly. And as soon as it tears, it allows laxity anteriorly. So you hear the knee pop and significant swelling. So if you look here in this picture, you can see that the ACL and PCL are inside the joint capsule. And so the classic finding with an ACL injury that helps you give it away is that the joint capsule has a limited space, a finite amount of room in there. And so the significant swelling is from the rupture of an increase of blood and fluid in the joint. And then you can also have hemarthrosis is, is very common in ACL injuries. So the positive tests are both the anterior drawer and Lachman. Those are both similar tests. The difference is just the angle of the knee and how you do perform the test, but you're pulling the tibia forward. And if this ligament is torn here, then the tibia will slide forward. That's how you tell. It normally slides forward a little bit, so, but if it demonstrates excessive laxity or there's no finite endpoint, that's how you know that the tibia is not, no longer connected with the ACL. And so the PCL is the exact opposite. So whereas an ACL, you might have an injury where somebody's ankle is fixed and you get hit from the side, the PCL typically is in this position where it's attaches posteriorly. So a force that's pushing the tibia backwards is the only type of force that's enough to rupture it. So a classic injury may be a dashboard injury where you can picture a dashboard hitting the front of the tibia pushing it backwards and tearing the PCL. So it's not nearly as common of an injury. It doesn't happen in sports as often, but if it does, usually the PCL is injured. Other things will be injured as well. Sometimes you'll have both ACL and PCL and other ligaments as well, but it's the exact opposite test. You push the direction is posteriorly instead of anteriorly, and you're testing exactly the motion that would have caused the injury in the first place, a posterior injury to the tibia. So moving on to meniscus, you can see a meniscus a normal meniscus, what this looks like here, it's a cushion between the femur and between the tibia. And so the reason you have knee clicking is because if this is damaged, this bone, the femur will be riding on top of the tibia. Normally there's a cushion preventing it. And when you hear the clicking, you know that the bone is grating on the bone. And that's the classic exam finding that you, that you hear. Um, the positive tests though are McMurray and Thessaly. So you need to know those names and they're basically exacerbating the motion. So McMurray is where you picture somebody laying out on their back on a table and you basically put the tibia in varus and valgus stress and then you twist it in circles and what you're doing is rotating the tibia in circles trying to get a position where this bone touches this bone and as soon as you hear the clicking with the mcmurray or thessaly test you know that the meniscus isn't properly cushioning these two the thessaly test is similar but you're having the patient squat down and basically hop around at various angles to demonstrate the same sort of clicking sensation. But they're all the same sounds and they're all looking for the same thing, just basically bone on bone, with, which indicates a damaged meniscus. Usually not as acute as ACL and PCL. Usually it's a more chronic insidious thing. And this, the exam findings are quite a bit different. So the MCL, which you can't really see the MCL on this, this angle. So this would be the LCL here but it's the same thing on the other side. So if you, if you notice the collateral ligaments, so it's 
attaching the femur to the tibia. It's not inside the joint capsule. So there's not nearly as much of a hemarthrosis presentation. But if you can see here, this is really tightly connected to the meniscus and the rest of the joint space. So that when you hit, so usually you need a hit from an angle from the outside. So with an MCL, you need a hit here laterally, which causes stress between this joint. If you picture the joint stretching, the tear happens on the opposite side that you're hit. And because it's tightly attached here to the meniscus, if you tear the MCL or LCL, usually you can have damage to the ACL and meniscus as well because it's so closely attached. So the unhappy triad is the MCL, the ACL, and the meniscus. And again, it's, it's the finding of opposites. So the MCL, when it's injured, you have laxity with valgus stress. So when you pull the tibia or the foot this way, laterally, you stress this ligament. And when you pull the tibia this way, you stress this ligament. It's just a matter of stretching. So you got to keep your var varus and valgus stresses um, straight in your head. And then patellar tendon is another interesting one. So you have the continuation of the quadriceps, quadriceps tendon, you have the patella, and then you have the patellar tendon attaching here to the tibia. So if you rupture this ligament, picture it across straight through here, you separate the connection, the ability for the quadricep to extend the leg. So you have a high riding patella because this is unopposed. So now it pulls the patella up. So you'll see that on an x-ray, it may be subtle. And then when you lay, have a patient lay down and say, lift your leg up, they can pull this portion of the leg, but the tibia tends to droop behind because there's no longer a connection here. And you also, if you said, hey, have your leg off the end of the table, and if you say extend your knee, you also wouldn't be able to do that. With a full thickness tear, you can't extend the tibia because it's lacking a connection here at this point. So the exam findings for each of these are quite a bit different. The question itself wasn't supposed to be hard. It was just supposed to demonstrate the significant difference in presentation. So if you just keep the anatomy of these right, you have the MCL here, you have the LCL here, you have the ACL or the ACL and the PCL here, you can sort of keep this straight in your head. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So a 47-year-old male presents to the clinic for follow-up of diabetes. He takes metformin, denies changes since his last follow-up six months ago. At his last follow-up, metformin was started in addition to discussion of healthy dietary and exercise choices. A physical exam, his blood pressure is 127 over 78. His heart rate is 82 and his BMI is 31. His hemoglobin at A1C is 7.4 today, but he reports feeling very well since his last visit. Which of the following is the best next step in management for this patient? So the choices we have are A, semaglutide, B, glimepiride, C, basal bolus insulin, D, referral to an endocrinologist, and E, lifestyle modification. So the answer for this one was semaglutide A, um, and will be bolded kind of what has been going on that's been important here. So he's already started on metformin, so which is usually the first medication choice in diabetes management. He's also obese and his A1C still isn't at goal after at least three months of follow-up. Six months I, is what that's supposed to say, not three months. So let's go through diabetes management in general. So typically you start with lifestyle modification, right? The question said that he had had a long discussion. Lifestyle modification includes healthy dieting, exercise, so on and so forth. And then once that doesn't work or once that is implemented and still isn't seeing achievement of goal, you would start oral metformin, which had happened in this patient. Then from that point, if you still aren't meeting goal and he hadn't met goal over six months with both of those, then you typically add your non-insulin anti-diabetics and then you can proceed to insulin. It's not always this simple, but if you keep this sort of simple flow chart in your head, you can at least have sort of a stepwise progression that you're looking to go through. Um, and then you can sort of cross things out from there. You knew insulin was, especially basal bolus was a little too extreme. Usually you wouldn't start with the, with the bolus regimen in the first place. And he was already on metformin. You've already tried lifestyle modification. You'd want to continue that, but you wouldn't say that's the only choice for treatment in this patient. So let's go through some of these diabetes medications, especially the non-insulin diabetics that we talked about. So metformin is the first one. The mechanism inhibits MGPD which basically causes decreased hepato hepatic gluconeogenesis, so decreased glucose production, just helps your body regulate its own, its own glucose better. Um, side effects, though, GI upset is by far the most common. So if a, if a question asks which the most likely side effect, you would choose GI upset. 
but as we all know, it can cause kidney injury. And then the highest yield finding is the lactic acidosis. So in a patient on metformin develops a anion gap metabolic acidosis, keep metformin in mind and don't get tripped up with um, more complicated questions. It can be simple as changing the medication. The GLP-1 agonists, so it activates the GLP-1 receptor and it also helps regulate glucagon and satiety. So the appetite is appetite changes are largely why this has been useful for obesity. So this is prescribed just in the treatment of obesity. It's also been approved for that as well. So it can cause weight loss, which is usually a good thing. So it's a side effect that's wanted. Pancreatitis is a rare side effect and then gastroparesis. So if it's decreasing your appetite and slowing your gastric emptying, there's a possibility that in diabetic patients, you can worsen the ability for them to pass food beyond the stomach. A high yield thing you'll may hear in the commercials is avoid in these in the men's syndromes. So there's potential risk for medullary thyroid cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer in the men's syndromes. Sulfonylureas aren't used as much anymore, so that was glomeparide in the last choice. So it basically causes endogenous insulin release, which can be useful because it's almost like an insulin medication. It's causing your own endogenous release, except it's much more difficult to control. So it continues releasing insulin even when glucose is low, and hence why it can cause hypoglycemia. It causes weight gain because insulin is an anabolic hormone, which tends to cause weight gain in general. And then the first generation sulfonylureas can also cause the disulfiram-like reaction. So can if you see a patient with these taking alcohol, they could have a really um, distressing sort of disulfiram reaction. The SGLT2 antagonists. So if you remember, SGLT2 is in the proximal tubule and it co-transports glucose with sodium. And so when you block that, you block the ability to reabsorb glucose in the proximal tubule. So you excrete it in the urine. So you're directly getting, getting glucose out of the urine and out of the blood. So side effects, UTIs, right? Glucose is in the urine. Bacteria can use glucose to proliferate. And then dehydration. So as you excrete glucose in your urine, water and fluid goes with it. You cause dehydration, which can lead to orthostasis. So you can also have candidiasis as well, right? Glucose in the urine tends to be a risk factor like diabetes is for candid candidiasis. So the high yield thing here that's recent that you'll get um, pimped on in internal medicine a lot is that you reduce cardiovascular mortality in those with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So now you can prescribe these just in the setting of cardiovascular disease, even without diabetes now. And then the last one is the thiazolidindiones. So the glitazones basically are what they're known as. So they activate PPAR gamma. Don't confuse this with PPAR alpha, which is activated by fibrates. Keep in mind the gamma is important. Um, again, it increases gene transcription. So that's the different in the mechanism here compared to the other medications. So side effects, much like sulfonylureas, they cause weight gain. But these, the high yield things here are heart failure and osteoporosis can be caused or worsened by these medications. So you want to avoid these. So in the last question, <clears throat> SGLT2 or GLP-1 agonist was the right answer. A lot of times that's a preferred second choice to metformin, even sometimes a first choice. You generally avoid sulfonylureas these days. S an SGLT2 antagonist would have been a good choice as well. Um, and even a glitazone could have been good if the patient didn't have heart failure as well. So you need to use the contraindications and indications to help guide your choice. And if you only see one good option, you know that usually you can pick that option. Okay, let's do the next question here. A 42-year-old female presents to established care. She reports no symptoms, no history of medical conditions, and she takes no medications, doesn't smoke, doesn't consume any alcohol. She does eat fast food three to four times per week doesn't regularly exercise. Her blood pressure is 180 over 91. So you repeat these pressures 10 minutes later and it's 185 over 90 on the right and 182 over 95 on the left. Her pulse is 80, her respiratory rate is 16. Physical exam is with the normal limits. CBC, CMP, ECG and urinalysis are within normal limits. Which of the following is the best next step in management? So we have initiation of the calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, and follow-up. 
We have obtained fractionated urine metanephrines, admission to the hospital, <clears throat> and lifestyle modification follow-up in one month. So <clears throat> the choice in this question was A, initiation of calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitor, and follow-up. And so the bolded findings here are that a completely asymptomatic, previously healthy person with hypertension. And so this is supposed to get at the primary hypertension and the different stages. And so we'll go through, so B obviously would have been for pheochromocytoma, C would have been for hypertensive urgency or emergency, and D would have been for if you think that she can control the blood pressure with lifestyle modifications, or if you're suspicious that it's not actually hypertension. So let's do a follow-up question here before we get to the explanation. <clears throat> so it's the same exact question, and now it's asking for which of the following additional tests would be indicated. So would you do a coronary angiography? Would you do a urine drug screen, renal duplex ultrasound, or fasting serum lipids? So the choice here was fasting serum lipids with, again, <clears throat> the physical exam was normal and all of her labs were normal. So you're basically, it's basically asking you which additional tests would you need for a patient presenting with primary hypertension and you would get serum lipids. So obviously coron coronary angiography, UDS, and renal duplex ultrasound would be in the setting of some hypertension you would be suspecting due to something else. And so now we get into primary versus secondary hypertension. So the reason I chose this question, it can be tricky, but they're basically wanting you to choose reasons why you think it's secondary. And so here's a mnemonic you can use, RRAS or RAS. Um, so the first one is if hypertension is refractory to three medications at maximum dose, you may suspect secondary hypertension and you may wanna go through any of the second or other options that were in that question. If the onset of the hypertension is rapid, like days to weeks, if it's at an unusual age, like a 30-year-old or a really old person who previously didn't have hypertension, or if there are specific symptoms or findings, notice how the previous question had normal physical exam findings, normal lab findings, but if, you, if it said there was abdominal bruise, you may suspect renal artery stenosis. If there was hypernatremia and hypokalemia, you may suspect aldosterone issues, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and so with specific symptoms, you would think the same thing. So with any of these four, if they were present in the question, I would look for an option to test secondary hypertension and look for the option that's specifically testing for what you want. So a duplex ultrasound would have tested for renal artery stenosis, um, electrolyte abnormalities or um, primary aldosterone concentration would have checked out an aldosterone issue. So if you don't see these, I would treat it like uncontrolled primary hypertension. And so for the initial evaluation, you want to get these four tests. You want an EKG, you want a lipid panel, you want a urinalysis, and you want a complete metabolic panel. Obviously, the metabolic panel tells you if there's any electrolyte abnormalities. A UA tells you if there's kidney damage from the hypertension or if it's secondary to a glomerular disease. A lipid panel can key you into a metabolic syndrome. And then an ECG is always useful when establishing the diagnosis. So you always get those four tests. If it gives you an option for one of those four that hasn't been done, choose that one. And so now we're getting into the stages. And this is what the first question was getting at. So we have pre, we have stage one, and we have stage two hypertension. So pre is just when the systolic is within 10 above normal. So this is not quite hypertension, but it's basically a progression of the stage of hypertension. So this is what you treat with lifestyle modification. And don't forget that there are stages and there are benefits for each lifestyle modification that's more than the other. So weight loss is typically, if you're overweight, so if you see a person with a BMI of 25 or greater, weight loss is the most blood pressure reducing modification you can make. But if there's not, if they're not over 25 BMI, a DASH diet, so the dietary approach is to stopping hypertension would be your next choice then exercise, and then dietary sodium. So if you're given multiple lifestyle choices, remember to pick in this order. The next one is stage one hypertension. So you can see the, the numbers there. So you do a lifestyle change and usually you do one hypertensive. So I've given those criteria down there, diabetes, CKD, or ASCVD. 
on an exam, I would typically just add a hypertensive. They're trying to hint at primary hypertension. And then if over 140, over 90, then you need two hypertensives, which was exactly the choice in this first question. Her blood pressure was repeatedly 180 over 90, and she had no symptoms. She had no findings of secondary hypertension. She was a previously healthy person. Her labs were totally normal. So you would want to implement lifestyle and two hypertensives. But keep in mind that if a person is diagnosed for the first time, they also may give you the option for ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So if you suspect that it's white coat, a patient that is healthy, isn't overweight, has no comorbidities, and has hypertension in the office, you may say, hey, monitor your blood pressure daily or weekly at home and follow up in a month. So that's a reasonable choice prior to initiating medications. Um, but in this patient, her blood pressure was 180, over 180, over 90. So you'd want to go ahead and start medication. If it was below 180, over 90, I would say that it could be worth it to try ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And so here are the four choices of class medications that you have for primary hypertension. We have ACE inhibitors, we have ARBs, we have thiazide diuretics, and we have calcium channel blockers. So ACE inhibitors work by blocking the angiotensin converting enzyme. So you can't have the production of angiotensin two. And so you basically lose all of the secondary actions of angiotensin two. So you reduce the blood pressure, you reduce tubular sodium and chloride reabsorption, you reduce aldosterone secretion, and you reduce the direct vasoconstriction that happens due to angiotensin two. Side effects are cough because angiotensin one, when it can't be converted to angiotensin two, can be converted um, ends up in bradykinin, which can lead to a cough, hyperkalemia, because aldosterone is normally helping you get rid of your potassium, which when you can't do that, you can have hyperkalemia and acute, acute a kidney injury as well. Angiotensin II typically constricts the efferent arteriole a little bit more than the afferent, so you have a little bit of extra glomerular filtration when you block angiotensin II, you have more dilation of the efferent compared to the afferent, which causes more blood to flow past the glomerulus. And so it can cause um, acute kidney injury, and it'll look like the creatinine is spiked as well. So that gets into the high yield. You avoid this in bilateral renal artery stenosis because you need the glomerular perfusion in these patients, and you risk precipitating a worsening of their condition. In unilateral renal artery stenosis, you can use it, and it can be helpful. It's also useful in diabetic patients. In diabetic patients, you want to prevent as much, limit as much of the extra filtration of glucose as possible. And so it helps send some of the blood and keep perfusing the kidneys. Angiotensin II receptor blockers or ARBs, they work in a similar way, but instead of blocking angiotensin converting enzyme, they actually block angiotensin II's direct effect. So the only difference usually is that you avoid the cough because angiotensin one is still being converted to two, you just block the effects of two. So if you have a patient who developed a cough secondary to an ACE, you can just switch them to an ARB and it works almost exactly the same way. So similar side effects. Thiazide diuretics aren't shown here in this picture, but if you remember the distal convoluted tubule, the sodium chloride co-transporter, it blocks the co-transporter. So you can have hyponatremia. You're losing the sodium that you can absorb in the distal convoluted tubule. You can cause gout because it can cause an increase in uric acid absorption and hypercalcemia as well. So thiazides are the unique diuretic that causes hypercalcemia. So it can be useful in osteoporosis. It can be bad in a patient with hypercalcemia. Um, it's due to the sodium calcium exchanger in the distal convoluted tubule. So you can treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus with this. So keep that in mind if that's a choice. And then it also increases lithium concentrations as well. So if a patient on lithium has um, super therapeutic lithium concentrations, you can consider that thiazide diuretic is classically involved. Then the last class is dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So remember these dihydropyridine inhibits calcium channels in vascular smooth muscle. Non-dihydropyridine preferentially work in the cardiac muscle. So side effects are is exclusively due to the vasodilation. So if you're blocking vasoconstriction at the arterial level here, 
You can cause orthostasis because you're not sending the blood back to the heart and you're causing decreased perfusion and then lower extremity edema. If you picture vasodilation of the veins and you cause pooling in your legs. So those are the most common side effects. They're directly related to the vasodilation. But vasodilation can be helpful when you're treating Raynaud's syndrome. So Raynaud's syndrome, if it's primary and if it's not secondary to another condition, is usually due to over activation of the sympathetic vasoconstriction in the hands. And so if you vasodilate, you can help. So treat Raynaud's syndrome. So if they give you multiple of these four choices, then you have to pick based on any other secondary indications. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs look for a diabetic patient. Thiazide diuretics look for somebody with low calcium. And dihydropyridine and calcium channel blockers look for those with Raynaud's syndrome. So you can look to treat hypertension and something else, killing two birds with one stone with the same medication. Okay, so let's move on to the differential diagnosis section. So the first one we have is acute testicular pain. What differentials come to mind when you think of acute testicular pain? So I've got three here that I think are worth going through. So this is acute non-traumatic testicular pain. So the classic one you think of is testicular torsion. So if you have torsion up here at the spermatic cord, you can picture twisting, you obstruct the venous flow back, you obstruct the arterial flow in. And so it's sudden onset. So basically if the testis isn't properly attached to the base of the scrotum, it can be sudden onset following usually exercise or something along those lines, getting hit in the abdomen. You have scrotal edema as you can't venously drain the testy. You have horizontal lie. So it could be the testis instead of being more vertical will be positioned flat. And then the cremaster reflex could be gone as well as you compress the vascular flow and the nerve supply that's typically in the spermatic cord. And then you do not have relief with testicular elevation. So you'll find that classically in testicular torsion. And then ultrasound, you need the ultrasound to diagnose this usually, unless it's pretty obvious, then you can just go straight to surgery. You see absent Doppler flow. As you twist and twist and twist, you lose the flow here. And that's a classic finding on ultrasound that's diagnostic of testicular torsion. So a less common one, but I think is super useful is tors torsion of the appendix testis. So that's what this is right here. It's a remnant of the Mullerian duct. And so contrast this with testicular torsion. So it's insidious onset. It's focal tenderness, right? Because it's a specific spot usually. And then it's at the upper pole because that's where the appendix is if it's present. And then a blue dot sign. So if this torses, you'll see a tiny blue dot from the potential vascular compromise of this area. But the overall testis won't be engorged and there won't be red redness throughout. It'll just be at a focal place. So this is drastically contrasted from testicular torsion. So if they say focal blue dot sign, so on and so forth, don't get confused and think it's testicular torsion, it's appendicular torsion. And then last, epididymitis. So usually it can be caused by an STI or UTI. And so instead of it being diffuse, again, it's focal. So the epididymis lays here. And if you look at this picture, it's on the posterior portion of the testis. So you have posterior pole tenderness, relief when you elevate the testes. So why is that? So when you elevate this testis, you're basically, if you see the way that this drains normally, if the epididymis is inflamed, when you elevate it, you create a, a secondary way for this to drain and it helps relieve some of the pressure from the inflammation. And so when you elevate it, you relieve it versus torsion. When you elevate, you can't, you, no matter what, how you elevate the testy, you can't overcome this obstructed flow and so you don't have relief versus epididymitis. When you do elevate, you do have some relief and then look for secondary findings as well. So if it's caused by an STI or UTI, you may have some urinary discharge, dysuria, burning with urination. You may have some findings on urinalysis. So you typically don't need to do an ultrasound, but you may, if you're trying to rule out testicular torsion and the finding would be increased flow to the epididymis. So they may see also say increased focal flow posteriorly. So you're basically saying that flow is increased, it's hyperemic in the, in the inflama inflamed region versus torsion of the appendix testis. It would be an enlarged appendix, so obviously focal enlargement, possible hydrocele, and normal blood flow because the venous and arterial flow is not obstructed with appendix torsion. 
So let's move on. The next one is chronic cough. What are differentials that come to mind when you think of a chronic cough? So there are plenty others, but here are the classic four. And the reason I went for these four is this is a chronic cough that they want you to follow up in the outpatient setting, right? This is a family medicine shelf. So they want you to work through if someone just presents with a cough and otherwise seems fine, what do you do? So you look for hints. So upper airway cough syndrome, the findings are that it's worse at night. So it can be related to allergies. So it can be worse at night. And then you may have relief with antihistamines as well. So that's a classic hint for those two. If it's asthma, it may be a younger person. It may be only precipitated when I run, when I exercise. And then if you do pulmonary function tests, you may see abnormalities. But again, asthma is often reversible in the early stages. So if you see normal PFTs, but you're really suspecting asthma, you can do a methacholine challenge. So if you reduce the FEV1 by 20%, you know that you've precipitated asthma by constricting the bronchioles and the bronchi. If you're not able to respond and have worsening of the FEV1, that's indicative of asthma. GERD, so it's also worse at night, but in, in contrast, it's also worse after eating. So if you picture somebody laying down at night, the esophagus is flat and you reflux into your esophagus at night. So you may have relief with the PPI, like pantoprazole. And then we already talked about ACE inhibitors, but they're a common cause for a dry cough. So look for the hint of recently starting a patient on a new medication, now they've developed a cough. They may not give you that hint, they may just give you their medication list. So also look for the medication list. So for this, you would just stop the ACE and you would switch to an ARB. They need to be treated for their hypertension, but ARBs don't cause a cough like we talked about. So all of these are pretty mild, usually in the outpatient setting. And you can try one of, try antihistamines. You can try PFTs or um, giving them albuterol. You can try PPI and you can try stopping the ACE. And if you don't have any improvement with these measures, like one or two of these, or suspicious symptoms, then I would move on to getting a chest x-ray and evaluating it like a more complicated form of a cough. Okay, the next one here is shoulder injuries. So what do you think of when you think of shoulder injuries? Which ones come to mind? So I picked four classic and high yield shoulder injuries and we have the shoulder anatomy here on the right. So acromioclavicular joint dislocation. So let's look at the acromioclavicular joints. We have the acromion here and we have the clavicle. So this is the AC joint is what it's called. So you can have trauma or injury like working out, lifting weights can potentially have, cause this. So if you picture trying to, the positive test is when you adduct the shoulder. So if you picture the shoulder is going across the arm here, you're separating this space as the acromion is attempting to bridge this way across the shoulder. You'll have tenderness when you're doing that. That is the positive sign. And then you may have a palpable deformity as well. If you separate this here, the clavicle can be elevated or the acromion can be elevated. So if you palpate the top of somebody's shoulder with an AC joint dislocation, you'll feel like a pal palpable like knob, it feels like. So that's classic for AC joint dislocation. For an anterior shoulder dislocation, you have somebody who's hit posteriorly. Remember, the, the anatomy is just going where the forces are taking you. So the force comes posteriorly. You dislocate anteriorly. And you remember, the brachial plexus runs here, and the axillary nerve runs anteriorly. So you can hit the axillary nerve and cause damage. So loss of sensation of the deltoid and deltoid weakness. So you have a flattened deltoid prominence. If the, sh if the humeral head is dislocated anteriorly, this part of the shoulder feels flat. If you push here, you'll feel a flattening or you may see a flattening. Prominent acromion, because now this is normally a smooth contour between the acromion and the humeral head. When the humeral head is gone, you're just palpating the head of the acromion here. And then you have an abducted externally rotated shoulder. So if you picture this joint dislocated here, if you picture the humeral head here, the arm, if it's trapped here against this corner, of the scapula, then the arm will be stuck out in this position, abducted and externally rotated. So remember that and you'll keep these straight in your head. So posterior shoulder dislocation is the opposite force, right? So a force coming from anterior pushing the shoulder backwards. So what would that be? If you land with your hand outstretched, 
the shoulder is unable to compensate and the, the humeral head can pop backwards and dislocate posteriorly. So you'll have the opposite. You'll have anterior shoulder flattening. So this part of the shoulder where the humeral head is typically occupying space isn't there. So you have flattening of this portion. So it's a lot of opposites and dislocations, right? So posterior dislocation, the anterior portion is flat and the trauma is coming from the anterior side. And the arm is held in a deduction and internal rotation. So if the shoulder is dislocated here and it's stuck here against the acromion or further against the space here, you can picture that the, the arm won't be able to rotate externally. So it'll be stuck in a deduction and internal rotation. And then last but not least, we have a rotator cuff tear. So it's typically, most commonly, the supraspinatus tendon, which is seen right here, the most common tear. Um, it can either be traumatic, which can be acute, or if it's worsening of chronic symptoms, it may not look like an acute tear, but it is. It can be somebody who's had impingement for a long time and now has worsening of their symptoms. So if you lift the arm up and you have them hold their arm up, if this is torn, you'll have an arm drop positive. And then you'll have decreased abduction, right? You know that the supraspinatus, the deltoid, and the trapezius all are involved with abduction. But again, unlike the axillary nerve, the supraspinatus would not cause a sensory problem. So this is a high yield finding if you see this. Decreased abduction with intact sensation, you know that it's probably a rotator cuff injury. So I'd say the trickier parts, so AC just joint dislocation looks like it's it's very unique. You just have to be aware of it. Anterior versus posterior. Keep in mind what the humeral head will be doing, and you can find out what would be doing what the rest of the picture would look like. And then a rotator cuff tear. Just don't get it confused with an axillary nerve injury. Sensation should be normal unless there's a concomitant shoulder dislocation at the same time. You can sometimes have both. But usually if you keep these things straight, you can keep them separate. Okay, moving on. Differential diagnosis for rhinorrhea. Okay, there are plenty of other causes of rhinorrhea. Obviously, these are just to go, go over some high yield options. So the first here, we want to distinguish allergic rhinitis from non-allergic rhinitis. So allergic is exactly how it sounds. You'd look for allergy symptoms. You'd have watery eyes, watery rhinorrhea. You'd have real itching bilaterally, and you may have sneezing. And so usually if you see allergic rhinitis, you're sure it's allergic rhinitis, choose intranasal glucocorticoids first. So fluticasone, for example. Then if that doesn't work or you want to add something else, then do oral antihistamines. The first choice for allergic rhinitis is going to be intranasal glucocorticoids. They only stay locally here in the mucosa. They don't distribute systemically. You don't have to worry about systemic side effects of steroids. It's a high yield effective treatment for allergic rhinitis. How do we tell the difference between that and non-allergic rhinitis? So non-allergic can vary seasonally. Moisture in the air and temperature of the air varies based on the season. No obvious trigger, whether that's pets or outside or grass or whatever the case may be, there won't be an obvious trigger like there will be an allergic. And then it may be later in onset. So maybe a 20 year old who didn't have allergies, who's not having rhinitis. So if you see seasonal variation, no trigger and an abnormal onset, think of non-allergic. And so usually you can do either one or two intranasal glucocorticoids. So you may even not even see a change in the management. But if you don't see intranasal glucocorticoids, you can do intranasal antihistamines such as azelastine. So don't be confused if you see it looks like non-allergic, but they don't give you this as an option. You can still look for an intranasal antihistamine as well. And then now these second two, viral sinusitis versus bacterial. So viral sinusitis will have rhinorrhea. It'll have nasal congestion. It may have sore throat. It'll, it'll look very viral. It'll look mild. It may have a cough, may have a fever, but it won't be super elevated because it's not bacterial. So you typically treat this supportively. You can do saline sprays. You can do um, acetaminophen, so on and so forth. So you treat supportively and symptomatically. Bacterial, the only thing they're trying to get you to do here is can you tell the difference between bacterial and viral? So usually viral predisposes you to bacterial sinusitis. The sinuses drain in the same direction. And over time, as the sinuses are obstructed, 
by a viral sinusitis, it can progress to bacterial. So how do we know that it's bacterial? If it's more than 10 days, that tells you usually a healthy person can fight off viral sinusitis in 10 days. If you have a fever over 39 and three or more days of purulent discharge, right? Bacteria causes purulent discharge. Or if you initially improved and then you worsened, that tells you that you recovered from your viral sinusitis, but then it progressed to bacterial. Any of those three symptoms, and you can choose an antibiotic. So, and the antibiotic of choice would be oral amoxicillin plus clavulanic acid. So you'd need to do both. So you'd need Augmentin. So remember, only choose antibiotics. They will always give you an answer choice that has antibiotics, but only choose this if you see 10 days or more of fever, a fever of 39 degrees and three or more days of purulent discharge, or if you have the initial improvement and then worsening. If you don't see any of those three things, typically choose viral sinusitis. That's almost always what they're going after. Okay, so now let's go through some rapid review. We'll split it up into categories here, and then we'll we'll call it a, call it a day. So the first one, a young person with sharp and severe chest pain radiating to the back, unequal pressures in the right versus left arm. That's classic aortic dissection. So the descending aorta is in the posterior chest, so it radiates to the back, and the unequal pressures occur as the dissection can sometimes block off blood flow to one of the subclavians. Substernal chest pain, worse after eating and at night. We talked about that already. So eating and night are classic symptoms of GERD. Food can cause reflux and then laying down flat at night can cause worsening of the reflux. So keep in mind that chest pain isn't always a cardiac cause. And if they say substernal, the esophagus and the gastroesophageal junction is also substernal, not, not just the heart that's substernal. A recent viral illness now has chest pain, improves when leaning forward, fever, and a scratching sound on cardiac auscultation. That's classic acute pericarditis. The viral illness usually starts as an upper respiratory illness that progresses to an inflammation of the pericardium. The scratching sound is the friction rub that you're hearing as the heart is scratching against the pericardium that's inflamed. And so you know that's acute pericarditis. Typically, you treat that with NSAIDs, and then you can use colchicine to prevent recurrence. A young person with sharp chest pain, and then it's reproducible when you palpate their chest wall. So that's the classic high yield, not concerning, usually symptomatic treatment for costochondritis. So you have inflammation at the junction between the ribs and the costal cartilages. And so that's why it's reproducible with palpation. An MI, a cardiac cause, typically isn't going to be reproducible because it's internal pushing is not going to cause you problems. And then last here, a recent viral illness, sharp chest pain, worse with de deep inspiration, a scratching sound on auscultation, disappears while breath holding. Well, doesn't this sound like what we just went through? Except it's worse with de deep inspiration instead of leaning forward. And then why does it disappear while breath holding? So this would be viral pleurisy. So it looks very similar to pericarditis, but instead of the inflammation of the pericardium, it's inflammation of the pleural space. And so it worsens with deep inspiration because it's surrounding the lungs. So as you expand the lungs, it stretches the inflamed pleura, causes pain, and then it disappears while breath holding. So when you hold your breath, you no longer have the scratching sound that's occurring with the pleura, but you still have a heartbeat. So if you wanna differentiate these two, if you tell them to hold their breath, this will disappear versus pericarditis will continue to scratch as the heart is still beating. You can't tell a patient to stop their heart, but you can tell them to hold their breath. So that's how you tell the difference. Moving on here to abdominal pain, severe acute epigastric abdominal pain radiating to the back. It sounds kind of like dissection, except they say epigastric. And so, you know, it's acute pancreatitis. Keep in mind that this presentation can look very, very similar to an aortic dissection. So they may kind of trick you with the epigastric wording. Long-standing history of GERD, refractory symptoms now has acute epigastric pain, rebound abdominal rigidity, it sounds like they may or may not need surgery. This is a perforated peptic ulcer. So long-standing GERD, long-standing ulcer history now has Peritoneal signs basically tells you that something has ruptured, and in a patient with long-standing GERD, it tells you that they've probably ruptured a peptic ulcer. An obese patient, history of CAD, 
abdominal pain, precipitated with eating. Now they started avoiding food and they're having weight loss. So they're not trying to, but they're having weight loss. That's a classic for chronic mesenteric ischemia. So that's food aversion. So this is essentially, if you think of, want to think of how you, how do you understand chronic mesenteric ischemia? This is also known as intestinal angina. So if you think of what angina is, angina is chest pain that's produced by exertion because atherosclerotic plaques are obstructing blood flow to the heart. And as you exert yourself, you're unable to get blood flow to the heart causes chest pain. Eating is the same thing as exercise for the GI system. So as your blood flow increases to the GI tract, as you're trying to digest your food, it causes pain, abdominal pain that's chronic, causes food avoidance, much in the same way that angina can cause exercise avoidance and weight loss. That's classic. Middle-aged female, epigastric abdominal pain radiating to the right side and the back also has fever and leukocytosis. So that is acute cholecystitis. Remember, if they say epigastric pain, don't be tricked. Acute cholecystitis, they're not always going to say right upper quadrant pain. So you can say epigastric pain and still look have that acute cholecystitis picture, especially if you see the classic demographic with fever and leukocytosis, maybe has a history of abdominal pain after meals, so on and so forth. Severe unilateral frank plane, groin pain, periodically worsens and improves. That's nephrolithiasis. So colicky is the way they describe this because it can come and go, but it's severe and it radiates to the groin. So keep that in mind. So in family medicine, they often test you on OB-GYN concepts as well. So let's go through some OB, classic OB presentations. A G1P0 patient presenting at 32 weeks with gestational diabetes has uterine fundus measuring 36 centimeters. So that's polyhydramnios. So Gestational diabetes causes fetal glucosuria, which leads to excess amniotic fluid. So remember, diabetes is vastly the most common cause of polyhydramnios. And so you can tell when a patient is at 32 weeks, you expect the fundal height to be 32. So you can usually keep the weeks in line with the centimeters. So you know that 36 is more than 32. So you would generally say that that's polyhydramnios. A G2P1 presents at 21 weeks with a blood pressure of 145 over 91 and three plus pitting extremity edema. So that is diagnostic for preeclampsia. So you need a blood pressure of 140 over 90 and a 24 hour urine protein excretion of 300 milligrams, or you can have secondary organ dysfunction as well. So you would probably need to check the urine protein in this patient. A patient at seven weeks gestation with persistent nausea and vomiting now has orthostasis electrolyte abnormalities as well. So excess nausea and vomiting in a pregnant, pregnant patient, always think of hyperemesis gravidarum, so pregnancy-related vomiting that is uncontrollable. Um, and so you either need to follow up with them outpatient and treat with, you can treat with vitamin B6, you can treat with antihistamines, or if they have severe electrolyte abnormalities, like this patient or orthostasis, you may need to admit them to the hospital and give them IV fluid rehydration. A pregnant patient with generalized pruritus, worse on the palms and elevated bile acids. That is classic for ICP or intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Don't confuse this with pregnancy associated pruritus. That would be usually it's worse on the abdomen and you don't have elevated bile acids. So that's a very symptomatically treated benign condition. Intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, usually you want to treat with ursi-deoxycholic acid is the treatment of choice. And then a G3P2 with the chronic hypertension presents with decreased fetal movement and uterus smaller than expected for gestational age. So we have the exact opposite of the first choice here. This is oligohydramnios. Hypertension um, can cause constriction of the vessels of the placenta and can cause decreased perfusion of the fetus, which leads to oligohydramnios. So diabetes is the most common cause of polyhydramnios and hypertension is usually a very common cause of oligohydramnios. And last but not least here, let's go through pediatrics because family medicine can often touch on pediatrics as well. So a child with six day history of fever, red eyes, redness of the mouth and the tongue and then hand and foot swelling. So this is Kawasaki disease. So you have crash and burn. So the C is conjunctivitis, the R is the rash, the A is the adenopathy, the S, the strawberry tongue, which is the tongue redness, the H is the hand and foot erythema, 
And then the burn is the fever for five days. This patient had a six day history of fever. So as you do Kawasaki questions, always do the crash and burn in your head and make sure that it lines up. A one-year-old male with UTI, stools one to two times per week, blood on toilet paper and anal fissures. So the UTI can be a distractor and it can also be secondary to this. This is functional constipation. As you get constipated in a child, the rectum dilates, it can obstruct the urethra or compress the bladder, which can lead to UTIs when you cause urinary stasis, common cause of constipation or common secondary finding from constipation. A child with red, itchy eyes, runny nose and a rash spreading from the head to the rest of the body. So when you see a, a cephalocaudal spread of a rash, you think of measles and you think of rubella. Um, but the red itchy eyes and the runny nose tells you that it's probably measles in this case. They may have a history of being unvaccinated or their parents may not believe in vaccinations. A five-week-old previous healthy male with projectile vomiting and it's formula colored. So formula colored tells you it's not bile. Projectile tells you that there's a physical obstruction and that five-week-old male, so a one-month healthy male is typical of pyloric stenosis takes about one month for the pylorus to be obstructed enough to cause the vomiting. So previously healthy, and they may look really, really hungry or thirsty after they vomit because they're just wanting the food that they just threw back up. No childhood immunizations, bilateral jaw swelling, presents with nuchal rigidity and Brodzinski sign. So nuchal rigidity and Brodzinski sign are meningeal signs. The jaw swelling and the history of immunizations not present in this child indicates that it's mumps. So mumps can cause parotitis, it can cause meningitis, it can cause pancreatitis, and it can cause orchitis or inflammation of the testes as well. So this patient had parotitis and meningitis, but look for any of the other two as well. And then last, a five-year-old with right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and a palpable mass. So what's the common cause of this triad in a child? This would be a biliary or colodocal cyst. Biliary dilatation due to a cyst um, obstructs the biliary tract, which causes jaundice. You can feel the mass, and then it causes right upper quadrant pain. And remember, these need to be removed because there's a risk for malignancy in the future. So you need to follow that treatment course if you see one of these. And so that's the last one here. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this sort of content helpful. Um, and so I know which type of videos you guys like in the future. And thanks again for tuning in.